Welcome back. We are ready to get started for our next panel. We have a great panel lined up. We're going to start with one of my favorites, Dr. Sahira Long, who is a board certified pediatrician and lactation consultant and a fellow of both the AAP and the ABM. She comes to us from Maryland. And welcome, Dr. Long. It'll help if I unmute myself, right? <laughs> Thank you, Tanisha, um, for that introduction. I'm going to um, share screen and get our panel kicked off. Um, if I can find it. All right. So, um, so I'm Dr. Long. I'm going to be the host for this panel. And I have a few lovely researchers with me on the panel today. Um, so first you'll hear from me about the journal itself. Um, second, you're, you'll hear from um, Adola Guy Dumphy. And then you'll hear after that from Dr. Barr, Alexis Barr. And then finally you'll hear from um, Dominique Love. So, before we jump in, I wanted to first acknowledge the land that I am on as I present to you from Maryland, as Tanisha said. Um, so as we gather in this virtual space, I would like to acknowledge the Anacostan and Piscataway people who are the traditional custodians of the land from which I am presenting. Um, I'd also like to pay my respects to the elders past and present of these lands and extend my respect to other indigenous people who are present. Um, and of course, as a pediatrician, we will always have some objectives. So by the end of this panel, um, I'm hoping that you'll be able to at least describe the process that was used in developing the breastfeeding medicine special issue on black breastfeeding and summarize at least one of the three manuscripts that you're going to hear about. Um, these manuscripts were selected by Mama Bug from the first part of the special issue. So I will start with how it all began. So um, this special issue was a labor of love for me. Um, it all started after the United States Breastfeeding Committee's 2019 meeting, the last one before the pandemic hit. Um, it was facilitate, the African American Identity Caucus was facilitated by our own Andrea Serrano. And she sent out an email after the Identity Caucus to introduce or to connect everyone that participated. And some of those participants between June and September of that same year started throwing around an idea to do a Black paper. Um, had never actually heard of a Black paper. I've always heard of white papers. But what we decided was that we wanted to create a paper that we would submit to an uh, journal that was by us, for us, and about us. Um, we described what we would want to put in this paper and discussed an outline through email and several conference calls. And ultimately, I agreed to take the concept and present it to Dr. Eidel, Dr. Eidelman, who's the editor-in-chief for Breastfeeding Medicine. Um, not only did he think it was a great idea to do a paper, but he said, well, what if we turned it into a whole journal issue devoted to Black breastfeeding? And what can I say to that? Like, who's going to say no to that? It's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And we started working on figuring out who, what the core topics would be for the article and then, or for the issue and identified several authors that we thought would be able to participate. And then in December 2019, so two months later, the World Health Organization in, informed of cases of um, pneumonia of an unknown cause. And then everyone knows the story. In March, the pandemic was declared, which put a halt on a lot of the work that we were doing towards this issue. And then we kind of regrouped and by July of 2020, the call for papers was issued. Um, so we issued this call with an aim of identifying 12 additional articles that we would, or a total of 12 articles that we would include in 
one issue of breastfeeding medicine. Um, what we got instead was 37 abstracts, which included three literature reviews, three case reports, three perspective pieces, um, two brief reports, um, one public health practice paper, and 23 original research articles, um, one of which was withdrawn from consideration, and then one that didn't really categorize itself. Um, so Dr. Eidelman's recommendation was if we were looking for 10 papers, since we had two core papers that we knew we were going to include, um, if we were looking for 10 papers, then we should invite 20 papers to, uh, or about 20 papers to submit full manuscripts for consideration, um, and then we would publish the top 10. Um, so we did just that. We invited 19 full manuscripts, um, one literature review. We decided it would only be one literature review, one public health practice paper. All three perspectives were important for us. Um, and then two of the brief reports were included in 12 of the original research papers. Um, so the final product ended up being 16 of those 19 manuscripts getting published as opposed to just one issue, we ended up with two. Um, we had three additional, the two, two invited papers and then one that was submitted afterwards but went through the regular process. It was identified as one of the topics we wanted to be a core topic but didn't make it in for review before we submitted the call for papers. Um, so, I am very excited. I had help with this process. Um, all of the abstracts were reviewed by a panel of three. Um, so Dr. Kimberly Bug, Dr. Camille Clare, and Dr. Michael Young served as my abstract review team. They each painstakingly scored the abstracts, which um, were based, the scores were based on pertinence to the topic of the, the issue, the uniqueness of the perspective, the scientific rigor, and then we gave a bonus point if there was one, at least one underrepresented author. So we used the same criteria that are used um, to determine if you're underrepresented in medicine. And unfortunately, we had to use Google for those that we didn't know um, because this wasn't something that the, the journal, most journals don't ask what you're race or ethnicity is when you're submitting a paper. So the maximum score that any abstract could receive from the three reviewers that was um, averaged was 12. And then from the papers that we looked at, the range of abstract scores were four to 11.3. So almost the max that you could get. And then the average of those that were selected was 8.1. Um, so we also were asked to develop a list of potential manuscript reviewers that we submitted to the editorial staff, um, which included their specialty and or their focus area. And phenomenally, the, all 13 of these reviewers were African-American, um, mostly MDs. Um, so the final product we felt like was a good representation because it was about Black people, it was written with Black people in mind, and it was reviewed by Black people so that we made sure that the lens that it came through was the one that we wanted um, reflected. So I personally had to review all um, perspective pieces that were submitted and then edited as the guest editor every paper that came um, and provided approval for all manuscripts um, that were published. If I was listed as a co-author, of course, I didn't review them myself, but the editor-in-chief reviewed them. Um, so the first issue or first part of the special issue was released in February in recognition of um, Black History Month. And then the second part of the special issue was released in June um, in recognition of um, Juneteenth. So as of July 19th, so Monday of this week, there were a total of uh, over 11,000, almost 12,000 full text PDF downloads of the first part of the um, special issue. And the second part, which just got released a month ago, um, has already had close to 4,000 downloads. Um, 
the list that you see on this slide is the top five downloads from part one, and you'll actually get to hear from two of these um, authors today. So I will, with that, turn it over to, to Adwoa Jamfi for a review of her part, and we'll save questions until the end. Feel free to put them in the Q&A tool on Zoom or in WOVA, and I'll do my best to group them and ask them at the end of the session. Um, if you have a question for a specific author, please include their name or something to help me figure out which one. Um, so Dr. Or, so Adwoa, you can go ahead and unmute yourself if you're muted, and I will mute myself. Oh, thank you so much. Dr. Longan, and thank you so much, the Rose team, for the opportunity to join you for this important summit. For me, I'm very excited because to be able to join such big groups in the African American research field is an honor. So, thank you so much. So, the opportunity to talk about the work that members of my doctoral committee and myself published is also a great opportunity for which we are so grateful. So this afternoon, I share with you a study that we did among African-American women so far as their breastfeeding experiences were concerned, for which we try to use an equity lens approach to look at the issue. Please, next slide. So I know like most of us here are very much aware the issue of breastfeeding and its exclusivity during the first six months of life is a challenge all over the world. And in the US here, the situation is no different. And among our African-American infants, I know we are all very much aware that only two out of every 10 gets to be exclusively breastfed for the first six months of life, which is of great concern. So this is what moved us to really want to understand the issue so far as current literature was concerned and try to really have a holistic view of the issue so that from there we could, as a research community, a community of clinicians and whatever role we could be in, see where we can all help in meeting our objective. Please, next slide. So we tried to use the uh, Akezi and O'Malley's 2005 six-stage framework for a scooping review. And in trying to use this approach, we had to try to gather various available literature from the online databases of Sena as well as PubMed to help us understand our issue of concern. Please, next slide. So we tried to retrieve the various records which were readily available as of that time. And that gave us the opportunity of retrieving 487 articles of which after thorough screening, we were able to settle on 26, which met our eligibility criteria in that they had been written in the past five years. And they were full text articles and they were written in the English language. And we realized that most of these articles were mainly quantitative researches that had been conducted with a few being qualitative studies. Please, next slide. So using the Ascali and O'Malley C-State framework, we asked ourselves that what is the breastfeeding experience of the African-American women in the United States here? And based on these relevant articles, we try to read each of them iteratively and carve out the various key points that we found and came out of a summarized a report based on the tabulated findings. And this with one of our authors being a lactation consultant helped really validate our findings so that we could be sure that what we were coming out with was really what pertains to the, the field as well. Please, next slide. So, Following that approach, then we realized that three main teams had to explain the breastfeeding experiences of African-American women here in the States. Please, next slide. 
And these teams have to do with the health dimension, the cultural dimension, as well as the sociological perspective. So from our findings, we realize that the issue of the cultural dimensions have to do with where the family or the personal networks of the African-American women either helped them to breastfeed or not be in a position to breastfeed their infants exclusively during the first six months of life. So this has to do with the form of support that they also received. So this support could be adequate or otherwise. It also has to do with the, the kind of support that they get also from their peers, as well as even other members of the community who were not necessarily their family members. Then also issues of prejudice that existed within the communities of residents were also matters of concern, as well as some personal issues that they may have had. Then with regards to the health dimensions, this had to do with what really the health professionals as individuals provided during their encounters before, uh, during the period of pregnancy, during the birthing process and in the period. So the issues of baby friendly hospital initiatives, the issues of um, postnatal follow up that they got to experience, the issue of the WAKE program and how it was run, and the kind of information that they had access to with regards to breastfeeding were all things that influenced whether the woman and their family, they would agree to breastfeed the infant or otherwise. Then with regards to the sociological perspective, this had to do with the larger community of residents that the African-American found themselves in. So that if the society were to have been very much supportive of breastfeeding, be it the public perception in terms of the uh, socialization of the female breast, in terms of the public welcoming of breastfeeding in the public places, in terms of where they work, whether there were favorable policies that were in support of breastfeeding, like um, paid maternity leaves, whether they were even breastfeeding breaks, pl places to even pump and store express breast milk, all these things went into this sociological aspect, as well as even where they live and then the kind of support that they have within the environment. Please, next slide. So then we came to really understand that when we are talking about the African-American women here in the States here, if they would ever want to decide to exclusively breastfeed for six months or otherwise, then the kind of challenges that they faced were really real. And these challenges could be cultural, it could be health, it could be with the societies that they found themselves in. And if they were going to be successful, then that would mean that they would need a multifaceted approach. So that means that all stakeholders, irrespective of they being, whether in the, uh, the, their workplaces, in the health dimensions, their family members, their peers, the bigger communities they found themselves in, all of them would have to come together to see how in their own small ways they could be influential to meeting the various challenges that these women face and they could be supporting. And then we recommend that future studies try to see some ways that they could help in coming up with interventions that could be help to address some of these challenges so that the opportunity of helping see positive trends in the breastfeeding experiences of African-American women could be realized. Please, next slide. So we believe that the study that we had held some significance in that if really an equity lens approach could be used to look at the challenges that African-American women in the states here face with regards to their breastfeeding, then that will help us to really in, in a holistic way, address the challenges of breastfeeding by not just looking at one angle, but trying to look at the whole system and see where each of us could be influential in helping meet the needs of our African-American women who would want to breastfeed. Please, next slide. So we believe that 
health professionals, of which I know that a number of us gathered here today are, could all in a way, and I know we are doing, and so we should keep doing, and we should keep also encouraging others to do, that we should try to meet the African-American through the uh, um, a, a perspective that is sensitive to their needs, their unique needs. Because if we just want to go by just the medical model, then sometimes you miss out on what is culturally favorable to our sisters and their families, so far as their breastfeeding decision makings are concerned. And this needs of theirs should not just be looked at during the, the time of birth, and, but it should have been looked at right from the days that they decide to conceive through to the end of period. So that by so doing, then we could help in promoting the objective of breastfeeding. And then we should also remember that when it comes to our sisters who would want to breastfeed, it's not just about the woman, it's about the family, it's about the friends, it's about the larger community. So that when we are talking about us as Africans, Americans, then we should know that it's not just about that woman alone who sits there, who is supposed to be nursing the baby, but it's about the bigger society. Please, next slide. And we really appreciate the forms of support we receive from the University of Connecticut School of Nursing, and then um, an international peace scholarship from PEO, and as well as a pre-doctoral award that I received. And our study is now currently available, like Dr. Long already told you, and it's in the open access journal of breastfeeding medicine. So if you are interested in the full test article, you may please assess it there freely. Please, next slide. And these were some of the references. And I appreciate your attention. And during the Q&A time, if you have any question, we'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Advoa. Next up, we'll have Alexis Barr. Dr. Barr, are you able to unmute yourself and show your video? Yes, um, there we go. All right, hello everyone. Um, can you see my slides? Yes. Perfect. If I can get this to start. Okay, there we go. All right, um, good afternoon, everyone. Let me put my photo up or well, my video. All right, now I can see everything. Um, good afternoon, thank you so much for being here with us. We're gonna move forward so we can um, get through as much as we can. Um, there we go. So um, we know that um, in past research, we've learned that it's really important um, in African-American families, the African-American mother and the maternal grandmother um, in the role in the, um, that she plays in the life of her daughter or her granddaughter. Um, these younger women really tend to look up to their mother and grandmother for parenting information, support, advice, and this intergenerational communication really could reinforce or hinder breastfeeding practices. Um, depending on the advice and the support that is provided. So what I wanted to do in my study, I wanted to use an asset-based approach um, to really understand these infant feeding conversations that's taking place in African-American families. And so I use an intergenerational style approach, which um, allowed me to really get multiple accounts, well, the accounts from multiple generations within the same family. And so in order to be um, included in the study, all adult women needed to um, self-identify as African-American, Black, colored, or Negro. At least two generations in the family were willing to participate in the study, and at least one of those generations lived in the southeastern region of the United States. Now, additionally, the youngest generation, and that's who I call generation three or primary participant, they needed to have at least one child that they breastfed for three months or more, and that child was younger than five years at the time of the study. So what I did was I recruited 15 families and that totaled about, it totaled 35 women. Um, I interviewed each woman individually 
And um, these families consisted of either a triad, um, three generations, or a dyad, two generations. And so we'll start with the youngest adult generation. Um, she's who you would know to be the, the mother of the young child or the young infant. And so I call her the primary participant. So the second generation is the primary participant's mother or mother figure. And G1 or the oldest generation was the primary participant's uh, maternal grandmother or maternal grandmother figure. And so when I'm saying figure, um, there were times in the study where there were aunts, older sisters, older cousins, stepmothers who filled those roles. Um, so that's why they were included in the study. So um, if we look at some demographics really quickly, we'll see that the oldest generation was between the ages of 64 and 80 years old. They were married or widowed and had a high school education or higher. The second generation was between the ages of 45 and 67. Now there was one participant who was the stepmother to a third generation, um, but she was um, there during the early years of this woman's life. So that's why this family was included in the study. Um, most were married, had a high school education or higher. Finally, the third generation was between the age of 24 and 34. Married, um, most were married and had a high school education or higher. I just wanted to show here that not everyone was a first time breastfeeder. There were multiples that had breastfed multiple children, but there was one multiple um, that actually was a first time breastfeeder. She had breastfed her last child. So what I wanna do here is I wanna provide for you three levels of analysis of what I did. So this first level of analysis will really just, just here, you just see what these conversations, the categories of these conversations. So we'll take a look at the first generation. Now there were a total of six themes um, across all three generations, but um, for the oldest generation, what they told me they shared in their conversations was categorized into four themes. Guidance, which were those conversations that included advice or suggestions about um, feeding the baby. The next was um, practical assistance. So those were the conversations that involved help or material resources um, as far as feeding the baby. Reservations were those the conversations around worry, uneasiness or fears about feeding that baby. And then the fourth was affirmation. So those were the conversations that included comfort, assurance, or encouragement, okay? So if we um, take a look at the second generation, we'll see that in addition to those first four themes, they also told me about conversations or the nonverbal uh, communication that was observational learning. So that's when their daughter, stepdaughter actually saw them nursing or feeding um, a cousin, for instance, with a bottle or nursing at the breast. And finally, if we look at the youngest adult generation, we'll see that in addition to those uh, um, initial five, they also told me about some um, conversations that um, I categorize as perceived undermining. So these were conversations that they perceived lessened their confidence or hindered their overall success with breastfeeding. So if you look at the second level of analysis, I really wanted to know then, okay, if we know, I see what they're saying. So I wonder if there are differences between how the families fed babies, did they talk about different things? So what I did was I realized that there were three different feeding types in families. There was one where only one generation breastfed that youngest adult generation and the older two generations did not. Secondly, there were families where only two generations breastfed. So either the oldest and the youngest generation or the middle and the youngest generation breastfed. And finally, there were families that all three generations actually breastfed the baby, okay? So once I realized, okay, there are differences, I wonder when did these conversations occur? So this is the third level of analysis. And I realized that the conversations that they told me about um, fit into one of these four reproductive life stages. And this is of the youngest adult generation. So either preconception, prenatal, birth, or postpartum. So what I'm gonna do here really quickly is uh, talk about three differences that I saw between the three feeding types that I think are really important. 
um, we're going to look at when only one generation breastfed. So what I noticed was that during the postpartum period of that youngest generation, um, there was uh, they told me about conversations that related to the historical aspects of breastfeeding. And so they were talking about it from a pro breastfeeding perspective, though. So essentially conversations included, well, our ancestors did this. They fed white babies. You can also do this, right? Another point that I want to um, speak about is reservations. So these reservations really came from the older two generations. And and families that only had one generation of breastfeeders, these older generations were concerned about, well, I just wanted to know how she was gonna work and breastfeed, um, if she was eating the right things, and if she was mentally able to um, carry, out, carry out breastfeeding. So remember, these are older generations that had no experience, uh, firsthand experience with breastfeeding. Uh, finally, the perception of undermining. We'll see here that there were some conversations happening all throughout this younger generation's life. So I want someone to bring this up later in our conversation, but um, it started as early as preconception, right? They heard things like stop that, or when they became pregnant, a, whine, a, preg a breastfed baby is gonna be whiny, it's gonna be clingy, or you're crazy if you think you can work in breastfeed or more, more power to you. You need to give that baby a bottle once that baby was born. So these are conversations that were occurring in those types, in those families. So if we move forward to where two generations in the family breastfed, we'll see that this historical aspect of breastfeeding actually was spoken about um, earlier on in the life of that youngest generation. Okay, and it was still this positive um, way of thinking as it related to breastfeeding and how if our ancestors did it we have the same capabilities today. Um, also, the reservations weren't present during the prenatal period, but they were present in the postpartum period. And they were different from when families had only one generation of breastfeeders. They were more concerned about, you know, is the baby getting enough? Are you pumping enough? And um, when do you plan to, to stop breastfeeding? Also a difference between this, fam this feeding type and the previous was that perception of undermining wasn't present in the first three um, reproductive life stages, but it was present during the postpartum period and they heard things like you need to cover up or are you still breastfeeding that baby? Finally, when there were three generations of breastfeeders, we'll see that this historical aspect was still spoken about all throughout the life of that youngest generation. But a difference is the reservations were less because they weren't worried so much about when do you plan to uh, stop breastfeeding. And also you didn't see there wasn't any reporting um, of this undermining or feeling undermined. So what I see here is that um, thinking about the historical aspects we know historically that African-American women's maternal experiences have been negatively affected, right? By chattel slavery and this, um, you know, the legacy of wet nursing and involuntary breeding, et cetera. And previous studies have found that this cultural memory has been passed down from generation to generation and it has negatively affected breastfeeding behaviors. However, this study found that these families were actually using this historical knowledge to empower the youngest generation to change the narrative within their family. And as a result, these families were really reclaiming and reconnecting with this ancestral breastfeeding knowledge. Also, um, in all families, they reported positive components of their communication. But unfortunately, the youngest generation talked about a negative component, this perception of undermining. But I believe there may have been miscommunication only because when I talked to all these generations, they talked about the same stories, which was very interesting, but they talked about it from a different perspective. The, young, the older generation talked about it from a, a place of worry or fear, meaning, um, you know, I was just worried about how she was gonna feed that baby and work, or I just told her she needed to have a backup plan. But the youngest generation heard things like, you're crazy if you think you can work and breastfeed, or more power to you, you probably won't make it anyway. So it was interesting to see this um, shift in how they were um, expressing and receiving the same kinds of communication. So what I think is that older generations may have been unaware that their words actually mattered. And they, I don't think they intentionally tried to sabotage 
um, because they have better intentions than that, right? It seemed like they would love their, their family member. Um, and I think these messages were unknowingly sent, but I think it could have been more detrimental to that younger generation that was the first in their family to breastfeed and they were more vulnerable, right? Um, finally, I acknowledge that there were unequal sizing in the groups and I didn't intentionally go into the study saying, I am going to segment the sample size or se segment the sample. But what I realized was that the more generations that breastfed, the less likely the reporting of undermining or the perception of undermining in the reservations were reported. So though this may not be the lived experiences of all families, African-American families, this highlights that grandmother's experiential knowledge may be, um, may be influential, right, to the breastfeeding confidence. And it just continues to solidify that point. And then considering this influential role, I think it's wise that clinicians really can leverage this, um, include these grandmothers and, and great grandmothers into that conversation about feeding. And I understand that face-to-face -face and uh, may not be so easy right now, but I think that virtually um, engaging these women can be um, successful. And I think we've only scratched the surface and there's more work that definitely needs to be done. But I just wanna leave, um, leave it here now and just say that all generations do matter for many reasons, but especially because their presence um, matters for the success of breastfeeding um, in African-American communities. So I look forward to our discussion moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barr. And finally, we'll have um, Dominique Love present. And I'm just going to um, give a super shout out to Dominique. Our um, original panelist um, was not able to um, make it today. And one of her co-authors is Dominique Love. And she agreed to step in at the last hour. So thank you. Thank you for agreeing to step in and I will pull up the slides that Jamaica submitted and hope you can roll with them. All right, can you see your slides? Just let me know when to advance them, Dominique. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry, my voice is a little, <laughs> it's like a little hoarse. Uh, my son plays football, so I was like screaming and yelling. <laughs> Um, so hello everyone, I'm Dominique Love. I am a certified community health worker with Cradle Cincinnati and also I'm a peer breast friend um, with Reaching Our Sisters Everywhere. And next slide, please. So um, I'm not sure uh, what they only have on these slides, but I'm gonna kind of freestyle it too. Um, so AMAN started in about 2017, and um, we came up with the idea from a breastfeeding conference because um, Avondale breastfeeding initiation rates were very low. And that was something that we learned. <laughs> that was something that we had learned from the meeting. So with building trust through the community, we partnered with Cincinnati Children's and a local church to form a group called AMEN. Then it, stand, it stood for Avondale Moms Empowered to Nurse. But since then we have changed to become all moms empowered to nurse. Oh, sorry, I'm going faster than the slides. Maybe I should have stick to the slides. So um, AMEN, Avondale Moms Empowered to Nurse, um, a community-based participatory research project led by community breastfeeding champion moms. So that is myself and Jaden. Shelly and Brylin and then Tasha and Maisie. And we were the um, first three original breastfeeding moms. Next slide, please. So um, this is just more about the community of Avondale. Um, only about 55% of Avondale moms initiated breastfeeding. Um, that's just about the median, the income. So we could kind of skip over some of that. But if you want me to talk about it, I can't. But that's just some information about the actual neighborhood. So we were trained using um, a modified WIC peer counselor. So that's how we became um, the breastfeeding champion moms. Next slide, please. And we were the first champion moms. And that is myself, Tasha and Shelly again with Dr. Julie Ware in front of Carmel Presbyterian Church. And the church, that church is where we heard our in-person meetings. 
Next slide, please. And in our meetings, uh, we play games such as breastfeeding Jeopardy, bingo, and um, we, we play all sorts of games, but those were some of the few that we had on the slide. Next slide, please. And that is me teaching a lot because um, we don't only um, want to, you know, <laughs> show moms um, or just tell moms breastfeeding, but we also want to show moms what to do and just give them um, ways to practice and visualize it. Next slide, please. And we collect data by using something called REDCap. And um, we use those for new moms enrolling or, sorry, enrolling or repeat moms who come to every meeting just to collect data to see how far they've made it in their breastfeeding journey. Next slide. And these are so some more moms um, who are now, they are, they are actually all now uh, breastfeeding champions themselves. And so um, at our meetings, uh, we give moms $10 cover gift cards. We have childcare. We provide lunch for the moms and we even provide transportation. And this was before COVID. So right now during COVID, we do everything via Zoom, but they also still get to eat food and they also still receive the $10 cover gift card. Next slide, please. And so our group grows. So if you look at the very first picture on the top left-hand side, I think we had maybe one mom and a grandma, grandma. But since then, we have, our group has grown tremendously. Next slide, please. And this is more pictures of our slides, but um, we do, so before COVID, I have to keep saying that because before COVID, we were meeting twice monthly. We um, expanded our group. So we have a group in Avondale and we also have a group in Price Hill. But now because of COVID, we meet um, once a week, every Friday from three to five. Next slide, please. And this is where we took the community trends form of training with Rose. We took this maybe um, about two years ago where maybe it was about 20 moms who became um, transformers. And we did it with Dr. Kimberly Book and Miss Andrea, as you can see. Next slide, please. And this is our Price Hill group, pictures of families um, with their children, us playing games and eating and teaching. Next slide, please. And we don't just talk about breastfeeding. So we've had um, a number of different speaker there's, um, speakers there because we know everything ties hand in hand. So we've had speakers talk about sex and breastfeeding, lead, um, if moms don't know about housing, if they want to know about education. So we try to make sure we include it all. We had um, a dentist there. So we like to keep our moms engaged holistically. Next slide, please. And these are some of the special guests that we had. So we got Safe Sleep, um, Racial Injustice. We had Rick there, Mental Health, um, Reach Out and Read. So we um, involved a lot of different other speakers there as well. Next slide, please. And these, these are just more guests and our different flyers um, that we share with the families and um, the speakers. Next slide, please. And so far, we've hosted over, Amen groups have hosted over 1,029 participants. We've hosted 130 groups in two different locations and virtually. We've had 35 guests have shared additional resources with moms. And 23 moms have trained to be community transformer, COCs, best friends, and even community health care workers. Next slide, please. Yeah, that's and this just shows the rates um, from when moms first joined our group back in July 2017 to the growth that we had to now July of 2020. Next slide, please. And this just shows more um, graphical things that I, I really don't know how to explain. <laughs> Next slide, please. And this was us during COVID. So this is us via Zoom. Um, I think this was one of our meetings. Thank you. I think this is one of our meetings that we were doing and we just took pictures. 
And we also partner with um, All Children Thrive, which is another agency within Children's, but they helped us deliver bags to our families. And I know some of the bags had like diapers in them, um, hygiene products, hand sanitizer, um, Clark's wipes. And that was just something extra to, to tell the families, you know, thank you for joining us and, you know, thank you for your support. Next slide, please. And this just shows the um, community outreach that we have, or even the partnering families that we work with. So yeah, I see Cradle on here, um, the Lachaley U.S. Breastfeeding Committee. Um, we, we've had baby showers. We joined the Black Family Reunion. We actually have a breastfeeding booth there at the Black Family Reunion. So when families need to nurse or want to feed their kids, like we actually have a booth up there where families can go in there and, you know, take a, a, a rest stop or a breast stop, per se, so that they can feed the kids. Next slide, please. And to learn more about AMAN, we also have um, an article in the Breastfeeding manage, uh, Medicine, and it's called the African-American Breastfeeding Peer Support by All Moms Empowered to Nurse. So you can see it there as well. Next slide, please. And if you have any questions, that is my name and Dr. Julie name um, in our email. And we would also um, like to thank the late Dr. Neela Brindley. She was one of the founders and partner a partners who helped us develop AMAN. And, um, thank you all for the opportunity to share our work. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Great job filling in, Dominique. Amazing. <laughs> so I'm going to um, open up for some questions while I figure out the questions that others have asked in the chat. Um, the first question I'll ask, so y'all give me time to look for the other questions, is um, what were you most surprised by in your research or your work that you did? And we can go in the same order that you just presented in. So Adwoa first, and then Alexis, and then Dominique. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> For me, the most surprising thing that I saw was when I read from one of the articles, like from one of our findings, that the mothers really wanted honest and timely information from health workers. Then that got me thinking that then it's possible that even for some women, they would have really wanted to breastfeed their infant, but for the lack of honest information from our health professionals. Well, I don't know which health professionals may have been in those capacities. So I would encourage us that whichever opportunity that we get as health professionals or even as friends, as relatives or whatever capacity, let's try and give honest information to these uh, mothers who will approach us. And if we don't know, let's be honest to also say that we don't know, but we could direct you to this resource. So I think for me, that was one of the key things. And then the final thing was when I also learned that when they would really love to breastfeed, but for sometimes for the lack of breastfeeding role models within their communities. So, Let's try, if we can, to be breastfeeding role models for women who may want to breastfeed or help link some of these women who express needs to breastfeed to such persons, if we can. Thank you. For me, the, the thing that stood out the most was the idea of how we were, I know the, the beauty of the resilience of um, Black people. So, the fact that we were using something that was negatively imposed upon us, like slavery and wet nursing, how we were using that to there, then empower each other. Like we did this. We're gonna, we know we did it, it was wrong, but we were able to do it and we're strong, you know? So the fact that we were able to use that to then turn around and empower ourselves with, that was so amazing. I really, um, love the way we were reclaiming and reconnecting with that knowledge. Great, and um, Dominique, what most surprised you in y'all's work with Amen? Uh, what most surprised me was that um, 
a lot of first time moms, they wanted to breastfeed. Um, but in the hospital, a lot of male doctors, especially the, the white counterparts, um, they, I don't want to say they didn't have the patience, but I know that they don't have the time to do it. So a lot of moms complained that they were pushing um, a formula for them to feed as well as um, their, you know, the parents and grandparents, a lot of moms were first time moms. And a lot of, their, they, a lot of them didn't come from backgrounds of breastfeeding. So um, I like the resilience, like the speaker before me said, the resilience of the women who really wanted to do this, even when they had all these obstacles against them, they still wanted to push forward through it. So for me, it was the resilience also. Perfect. And then a couple of questions have come in from the audience. It looks like a lot of these are directed for you, Dr. Barr. Um, so the first is, do you think the educational level of participants included influenced their need or want to breastfeed? Um, quite possibly. I mean, but if we think about it, like my grandma was not educated. She had, what, three years at the very most of education. She breastfed all nine of her children. Um, so yes, that could have been that the newer or the younger generation being more educated could have been more likely. It could have been the reason why they were more likely to want to and to actually uh, start breastfeeding. But I mean, I think it's really about that support that's given and the drive behind it. Because whether you have 12, 12 years of education or 18 years, right? Like it does, I think it depends on what it is that you're able to garner from your community, the support that you're able to get and then the, the determination that you have. Perfect, thank you. And another question for you. Um, curious to know the age difference in the groups of the triad and diet. The age difference. Meaning within family? Or? Yeah, that's the way they posted the question, so I can't um, <laughs> interpret it however you understand it. Okay, well, there were, so again, the, the oldest generation was between 64 and 80. So there were older, like pretty older uh, generations for that oldest generation. Now, I'm really, I'm, I'm having a difficult time answering the question because I don't really know the intent of the, of the the author of the question. Maybe they can come off of mute and ask or I'll specify. see if they can do that. I'll ask the next question because okay. we're going to run out of time. Okay. Um, so this is another question for you. And then there's a question for Dominique. Um, so from Jerry McKinley, Dr. Barr would seem to be more valuable confidence in breastfeeding or lactation or scientific lactation knowledge and resources from elders. Hmm. It seems like just from, it's just a personal experience. Um, it seems like the confidence would seem to be very valuable because Again, my grandma didn't have it all, but she, you know, they passed down at least that, or at least it was out of not having any other resources that they breastfed, right? Um, and yes, formula was a status symbol, but what I learned from my participants, and this is another part of my research, was that these grandmothers were open and willing to learn. Well, that's about, about I'm sorry. Yeah, and I'll call seven I'm not sure if that's a question or someone that's accidentally. Oh, okay, it's probably. Going. Yeah, so what I learned was that these uh, older generations were willing and um, open to learning new things. They knew that they didn't know everything. So it was really nice to know that at least they were willing to learn things that they may not have had experience with. So I remember those were, there were those women who were grandmothers but didn't have firsthand experience or knowledge with breastfeeding, but they were learning as they went. So I think they're going, they're going to go hand in hand for sure. Thank you. And someone asked for your email address, Dominique, which thank you, Dr. Bug, for putting it in the chat. 
Um, and then the final question from the audience, and then I'll have one for everyone to wrap up. Um, so this is directed for Dominique. Um, the turnout for many of your events was great. How did you decide on the location? And did you have to move from location, from one location to another to get more participation? Um, so for us, it started, so um, for us, it was, I won't say it was really easy, but because peer-to-peer, um, -peer, I feel like when people see people who look like you and talk like you and act like you, it's easier for them to engage. So because it's led by actual women who look like the women who want to do it, it was easier. Um, we only had one location. We didn't have to switch locations. And um, it was because of the partnership between the communities and because um, I'm a very vocal person. So like I, a lot of the people I had already knew. So I knew Dr. Ware and I knew Dr. Anita Brindley. So by us already knowing each other, it kind of just made everything glued together like gel. Um, and Miss Anita, I'm, I'm not sure any are you from Cincinnati, Ohio, but uh, Miss Anita Brindley, she was a, a really big pillar at the community at Avondale. So it was already a foundation there. We just had to, I guess, plan it. We just had to plan it. So a lot of the women, um, they were very interested when they seen us outside because we were, we were like grassroots recruiting. We were going to different places, handing out flyers. We walked up to mom trying to find them. So for us, it, we didn't have a, a hard time. And that's what made us expand it to another community because we had women coming from all over the city of Cincinnati wanting to be in our group. Amazing, just amazing. And I don't know if you can see the chat, but community champions, relationships are vital, all that, all important. Um, and so my final question to take us home is for everyone. Um, and we'll start with you, Dominique, and then work our way back to the first presenter. Um, so if our summit participants could only remember one thing about your research, what would you want it to be? Um, if I wanted about our, the research that we do as amen, mm -hmm. um, that we are real. Um, we don't like, I'm not, I'm not highly, I'm not gonna say like, I'm not highly educated, I, highly educated. I don't have like a, a BSR master's. I just have a certificate. And um, I think the women appreciate realness. Like they love realness. <laughs> so they can appreciate that. So something that you can take away from is just being real and being able to relate to the people that you serve. You are highly educated in your community. So don't, don't ever take that away from yourself. All right, next, Dr. Barr. Yes, I you. agree with that. <laughs> um, and I love the realness. That's what's going to carry us. But um, one thing I would say is that it's really important that we don't forget about the elders and the experience and the um, what they bring to the table. So they may not have the highest of ex um, education, but they certainly matter. And so I think... Um, like Ottawa was saying before, we can't forget about the other family that's involved in this breastfeeding relationship. It's all of these components that actually matter to success. I think to, to run it out, I think for me, the greatest lesson that I learned was that the breastfeeding experience of the African-American woman in the States here is real. And it's not that the women don't want to breastfeed. They would want to breastfeed if they have the needed support, be it from the communities they find themselves or from us as clinicians or from the bigger society. So no matter where anybody is, we could all help in a little small way. So we light the little candle where we are, then we'll be able to achieve the bigger objective. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, ladies, for not just submitting an abstract to be considered for the special issue, but for representing so well today. Um, you all were phenomenal. Just, I can't even remember whose paper. I think we just ended up accepting everything that we, <laughs> whatever papers we invited to submit were all but one was phenomenal. So thank you for, 
making it hard to get everything into one issue so that we had to have two parts and um, the parts are available. Part one is available open access indefinitely. So if you haven't checked out the rest of the articles or these, we both, Kim Marie and I have both shared them in the resources on the, on the app. Um, so check it out while it's part two is some parts are still available, um, I think. So check them out while they're available. And I'm not sure who's coming up behind us. 